Hi, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. This is our last Grand Rounds until July. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, that we're gathered on the traditional and ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, the Wooten, and Musqueam. Uh, it's a pleasure today, and I'm really looking forward to this Grand Round, to, uh, to introduce Dr. Vincent Kuti, uh, who is, as you can see, an anesthetist as well as a palliative care physician. Um, and he's going to present the goals of care in perioperative setting. Uh, quite a, a, an exciting combination of, uh, of disciplines and support to the talks. Dr. Pucci. Thank you so much. Thanks for everyone for being here. So <clears throat> I would like to introduce to you Mrs. White. She's a 77-year-old woman with ischemic cardiomyopathy and severe COPD. She presents to the emergency room with a 7.5-centimeter thoracoabdominal aneurysm. She previously declined surgery because she was told that she had a high chance of complications. What do we do now? Now that she's facing imminent rupture and inevitable death, she's consented to the operating room. Surgery lasts eight hours. She's transfused 45 units of blood products. And at the end of surgery, she's brought to the ICU not requiring vasopressors or any further transfusions. The team is more than satisfied. This is the best that they could have hoped for. The family, however, was horrified. They asked to have all life-sustaining treatments withdrawn the following day. The team didn't know that the patient had expressed fears about the use of life support and spending her remaining years or time in a nursing home, if she were to even make it out of the hospital. How many Mrs. Whites do we know? How could there be such a vast chasm between what we did to the patient and what the patient really wanted? And how could we have more skillfully navigated this difficult situation? So good morning. I think everyone knows me here. As you know, I'm Vincent. I'm an anesthesiologist here and palliative physician here in Fraser North. I'm excited to explore with you this topic that I believe touches at the heart of what we do in medicine. I'm particularly interested in the intersection between perioperative medicine and communication, specifically around shared decision making and goals of care. I have no disclosures for today's presentation. So today, we are going to go beyond the problem of informed consent. We will learn about two communication tools, which are probably quite familiar with our audience, and discuss an approach to do not resuscitate orders and surgery and or procedures when patients come. So much of my training in palliative medicine has been focused to a large extent on sharpening the scalpel of communication to really mine the depths of meaning and language that our patients use in order to provide care that's authentically consistent with their goals. When we rely on the language of informed consent, we often ask patients to choose treatment course by comparing a procedure with a very high risk of complications and possible death to oftentimes a palliative approach and certain death. Is it not surprising then that patients often choose interventions? How many of us have heard, if I die on the table, at least we have done everything? I believe part of our work in medicine is to contextualize all of the medical decisions for our patients. Experts in surgery, palliative medicine, anesthesia, and geriatrics, and critical care have been exploring this exact topic. There is a review article published in the American Journal of Surgery entitled Informed Consent, How Much and What Do Patients Understand? and it came up with a sobering conclusion. The review of all the available evidence regarding informed consent for surgical interventions showed that adequate overall understanding by the patients of the various aspects of the informed consent process was reported in less than one third of studies. So this means that in more than 70% of studies, patients consented for surgical procedures didn't have adequate understanding of what they were about to undergo. And yet I'm sure in the pre-op consult notes, risks are listed, percentages are documented. How can we be communicating more effectively? 
Dr. Vicky Tang is a geriatrician at UCSF, and she actually studies advanced care planning and frail surgical patients. I listened to an interview with her about her communication techniques that she uses in a high-risk surgical clinic. Here's what she has to say. We delve into what's most important to you and address the conversation that way, trying to start with the big picture of who are you and what do you live for. So here's where the conversation is turned on its head. Normally what we do is we provide patients with a list of quoted risks and expect them to choose. Instead, she sees the patient in front of her as the person by looking at key considerations like what's really important for you, who are you as a person, and what do you live for? When we disclose risk, particularly by presenting multiple disarticulated risks for isolated physiologic systems, like 50% chance of renal failure, 70% chance of respiratory failure, I would argue that a vast majority of our patients aren't able to meaningfully apply those numbers to their lives. This drives home an important point. To help patients make decisions consistent with their personal preferences, we need to provide information about interventions in a way that contextualizes the medical decisions into a larger personal framework. But whose job is this really? I would like to challenge all of us not to think that it's just one consultant's exclusive responsibility, but that of the entire team. In an ideal world for complex cases, I think surgeons, anesthesiologists, geriatricians, palliative medicine docs, and critical care physicians should be involved in this, these important conversations. I consider you know, my specialty in anesthesia as one intimately connected with palliative medicine, as we serve as advocates for our patients during one of the most stressful times of their lives. And we have extensive critical care training. So I think as anesthesiologists, so we're uniquely positioned to be leaders in this conversation in perioperative medicine, but it's not only within our purview. The goal of these conversations isn't for us to say no to surgery or to determine if surgery is futile or appropriate, but instead it's taking the time to ask the patient, is this really what you want? And do you understand what you may be going through? There was an article written in Anesthesia Analgies in the Open Mind section entitled Anesthesia Guided Palliative Care in the Perioperative Surgical Home Model. And the authors assert, we must take responsibility in guiding discussions in care of frail, chronically ill and palliative patients in the perioperative setting. The Royal College agrees when it comes to the training of anesthesiologists. The core EPA that addresses the specific objective is number 23, and it's entitled Managing Goals of Care Discussions with Patients and Families, Including Perioperative Care Plans. And some of the key features of this EPA include leading goals of care discussions, building consensus around end-of-life decisions, and explicitly interpreting perioperative do not resuscitate orders. But there's no time for this. The authors of this paper here, Development and Initial Validation of the Risk Analysis Index, they sought to develop a risk analysis tool in elective surgical patients to help guide perioperative conversations. So they came up with a risk analysis index score, uh, which is made up of 14 items for detecting frailty, and it's made up of five main components. And those five components include the age, sex, and presence of cancer, medical comorbidities, cognition, residence, and activities of daily living, activities of daily living and cognitive decline, and finally, changes in cogn cognitive skills within the past three months. The survey was administered by clinical staff and it took less than two minutes to complete. If a patient received a score of greater than 21, they were subjected to administrative review aimed at improving perioperative uh, decision-making and outcomes. Needless to say, they found that rates of mortality and morbidity and post-op complications increased with frailty. I think we would all agree with that. Then the question becomes, well, it may not take so long for us to risk stratify patients and detect frailty, but how can we meaningfully use this information? So another set of authors proposed a communication algorithm applying that last risk analysis index score in this paper here. They looked at patients who had a risk analysis index score of greater than 21 and recommended going through this algorithm. So if their score is greater than 21, they recommended beginning discussion with patients and surrogates going over five questions, which I will go through shortly with you, going through the serious illness conversation and exploring advanced directives. If the intervention or surgery was potentially curative or diagnostic, then they recommended considering preoperative multidisciplinary planning. 
On the other hand, if this was potentially palliative surgery, then they recommended multidisciplinary discussion to reach a consensus on how best to proceed in the setting of the patient's goals and values. The five questions that they recommend going through are, what is your understanding of your illness and prognosis? What are your fears or worries for the future? What are your goals and priorities? What outcomes are unacceptable to you? And how do you want to spend your time if your health worsens? But can we actually have an impact with these conversations? So this RCT showed that short conversations can have an impact on our patients and substitute decision makers. The authors of this paper here looked at the effectiveness of conversations in pre-op clinics uh, in getting patients to communicate their wishes and goals with their proxies. The conversations lasted five to 10 minutes. They were led by anesthesiologists and patients were 65 years and older and they were scheduled for elective surgery. There were two groups. The control group um, got a routine pre-op anesthesia assessment. And the intervention group had specific conversations around CPR, intubation, and discussing wishes with their substitute decision makers. Interestingly, in the control group, 22% of the patients had communication with their substitute decision makers. And in the test group, 58% of them had conversations with their proxies around goals of care. Interestingly, there was there were decreased rates of readmission to hospital, which the authors couldn't explain, and the study wasn't designed to look for. And they also had increased rates of completion of powers of attorney. So then the question becomes, well, I don't know how to have these conversations. The good news is, though, is, though, is that we're not alone. In September of 2014, an advisory panel with leaders in surgery, anesthesia, palliative, critical care and geriatrics was convened to address this exact need to improve communication practices to facilitate goal concordant care for seriously ill older patients who present with an emergency surgical condition. Some of their recommendations include contextualizing how an acute surgical condition relates to the patient's underlying illness, to elucidate patients' goals and priorities with respect to prolonging life, achieving cure and maintaining function, Describing treatments that are most closely aligned with the patient's goals, directing treatments to achieve these outcomes, and affirming continued commitment to the patient's goals. One practical communication tool that I recommend is called best case, worst case scenario. It was designed for surgeons by palliative docs at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and this has been adopted to many other areas within medicine. This is what the communication framework looks like. We set the stage depending on the context of the patient's condition. We have to figure out which options for treatment we are going to present to the patient and their family. And then we use a visual aid. And I'll go through the visual aid right now. So if there are two treatments for a patient, we draw a star, which represents the best case scenario. Then we draw boxes, which represent the worst case scenario. And then connecting the star, the best case scenario to the worst case scenario, combining what we know about the patient's overall health picture, and our understanding of their current problem, then we have to put where they're most likely to be on this trajectory. And then finally, the fourth part is telling a story. Telling a story is key because it helps patients and families picture an unfamiliar situation. So if we take our patient from the beginning of this talk, based on all of her comorbidities and the proposed surgery, if we were to put her information, uh, her information into a risk calculator, we would see that she has a greater than 50% chance of dying, 80% chance of discharge to a nursing home, and 70% chance risk of serious complications. In other words, she's high risk. There are, let's say, two treatment options for her. One is for her to go for this emergency surgery, and the other is to focus on comfort as she dies. So if we were to take the operative intervention, we could say something like this. Hello. Is this Grand It is. Oh. Welcome. <laughs> so if we were to take her to the operating room, we could say something like this. If everything goes well, she will have surgery to fix part of her aorta. Afterwards, she will go to the ICU because she will be critically ill. If her luck continues, she will be discharged to her nursing home where she will need to work hard on getting her strength back. In the worst case scenario, after a long surgery, she goes to the ICU and continues to be very sick. So sick that she can't have her breathing tube removed and she requires dialysis because her kidneys fail. 
She may die a few days or weeks after surgery, unable to speak or interact with her family. Most likely we will get her through surgery, but afterwards she will be very sick. She'll need to go to the ICU or she'll have a breathing tube. She will likely suffer setbacks that will keep her in hospital for a while. She'll go to a nursing home where she'll be much weaker and I worry she will ever be independent again. On the other hand, if we focus on comfort in the best case scenario, your mother gets transferred to the palliative medicine unit where she'll receive medications and care to ensure her comfort and dignity as she dies. If we are lucky, there will be time for everyone to gather and say goodbye. In the worst case scenario, we admit your mom and the aneurysm ruptures and she dies suddenly and possibly in pain. If this happens, it likely means there will not be enough time for everyone to be by her side. And the and most likely scenario, we'll be able to provide medications to ensure your mom is comfortable. She may be more sleepy and may not interact as much as you would like, but she may be able to squeeze your hand. I'm hopeful we'll have time for everyone to gather before she dies. It's not enough for us to provide options to our patients and expect them to choose. It's our job to make recommendations based on what we know about our patients and our knowledge is about their disease and their treatment. While informed consent is a necessary component for decisions that involve risks, it's a process that does not sufficiently communicate an accurate picture of a clinical reality that patients need to navigate the decision-making process. So another communication tool is a serious illness conversation, which you are all very familiar with. As you know, it was designed for oncologists and it uses patient-tested validated language to help guide us in our treatment decisions. It's used now across a wide array of settings. Unfortunately, in surgery, this doesn't exist yet. So I've adopted the serious illness conversation. I'm not going to go through this because everyone here, I think, is familiar with the, the framework. So I've adopted the serious illness conversation. It isn't validated, um, but it's a start. So... And this could be used, let's say, in a high-risk pre-op surgical clinic. So we could start by setting up the conversation by saying something like, I would like to speak with you about your upcoming surgery and do some thinking about what's important to you so you can make sure you get the care you want. Is this okay? And then we assess their understanding. Can you share with me your understanding of what's going on with your health right now? And what's your understanding of what surgery will do for you? Another question we could add to this is how much information would you like going forward? And then we can explore key topics. So what are you hoping to achieve with coming in for surgery? What are your most important goals if your health worsens after surgery? What abilities are so important for you that you can't imagine living without? And if you were to become sicker after surgery, how much are you willing to go through for the possibility of more time? How much does your family know about your priorities? And sometimes people become so sick after surgery, they can't speak for themselves. Who would we go to to make decisions for your health care? Then here is, where I make, here is where I recommend making a recommendation using the best case, worst case scenario. So we could say something like, I've heard you say that life at all costs is really important for you or being home with my family is really important for you. Keeping this in mind and what, you know, what we know about your illness and the options that exist for you are the following. And then I'd like to discuss those options and look at what may be in store using the best case, worst case scenario and providing them with the visual aid. So there is one pearl that I would like to leave with all of you, but I think you guys are already familiar with this. Um, it's really, the, the question is geared to, towards providing, you know, person-centered, dignity-conserving care. And research has shown that, single question, that this single question can identify issues and stressors that may be considered important when planning uh, the delivery of someone's care. The whole point of this question is to reveal the invisible factors that might not otherwise come to light. And this is the patient dignity question. And the question is, what do I need to know about you as a person to give you the best care possible? As we know, asking this question helps our patients not only be seen as the patients that they are, but it also enriches our clinical practice. So now I'm gonna open up another Pandora's box and we can talk a little bit about do not resuscitate orders and patients who come for surgery. Before delving into this topic, I had to reflect on a few questions. What's so unique about the operating room and resuscitation? Why are we so uncomfortable with patients who come for surgery and have a do not resuscitate order? 
And if patients agree for surgery, are they not agreeing to resuscitation? We know that the operating room is a unique environment. One could argue that some of our interventions are tantamount to resuscitation. And where is the line between resuscitation and standard anesthetic care? Where do we draw the line? The risks of anesthesia and surgery carry real risks of morbidity and mortality, different from outside of the operating room. And yet we know that in the operating room, CPR is much more successful than anywhere else in the hospital. In this study here, 65% of patients who suffered a cardiopulmonary arrest in the operating room survived to discharge. And of those 92% of the arrests caused by anesthesia survived. And this is compared to in-hospital rates where, depending on where you look, less than 30% of patients will actually survive. So how do we navigate this unique uh, context? Thankfully, the Canadian Anesthesia Society Committee on Ethics has a position statement to help guide us in these exact scenarios. The two key points of this guideline are to review the do not resuscitate order and to clarify the status of the order in light of the upcoming intervention in surgery. When it comes to reviewing, they recommend asking if the patient is even aware of this. In one study, almost 50% of patients with DNRs didn't know that they actually had it. Do they understand the significance of what this means? What was the original intent of the order? Have the patient's circumstances changed sufficiently to revise it? And is the location DNR, is the, is the DNR location sensitive, i.e. care facilities? or nursing homes. And then we have to clarify the status of the perioperative do not resuscitate order. We have to review the anesthetic procedures required to carry out the intervention. And then we have to do some thinking. If cardiac arrest occurs as a result of surgery and full recovery is anticipated, should the DNR be suspended? If cardiac arrest occurs not as a result of surgery, in other words, due to their underlying illness, and full recovery is anticipated should the DNR be maintained. At the heart of this guideline is communication in order to help achieve some degree of clarity. Taking the time to have these conversations, I think will prevent us from falling into one of two extremes, either canceling surgery de facto or reversing DNR orders without sufficient discussion. So I have a few suggestions for starting the conversation around DNRs and surgery. I see that you have a do not resuscitate order. Can you tell me what you understand about resuscitation? And then I would recommend using this as an opportunity to share information in their context. So for example, if a patient has a DNR order because they're at a long-term care facility, we could say something like, if your nurse were to find that you had died in your bed, they would allow natural death. We know that people in your situation usually do not recover to their previous level of function. Now being in the operating room is unique. Is it okay if I speak with you about the unique features of anesthesia and surgery? You're going to be in one of the most monitored settings during your healthcare. Sometimes there are complications that arise from anesthesia and surgery that we can resolve. If a patient dies in the operating room, it can result from a surgical or anesthesia issue, or it can be from your underlying illness. We know that resuscitation is much more likely to be successful in the operating room than in other circumstances. And then based on what I know about your current condition and surgery, I would like to discuss with you about what we will do going forward. And here's where I recommend combining our knowledge of the patient's illness, the surgical condition, or the interventions that are being proposed, and then coming up with a plan to provide some clarification. We know that the specialty of palliative medicine started with building relationships with oncologists many years ago, and it wasn't an easy path as our surgical patients and all of our patients in general are becoming more increasingly frail and medical technologies are developing rapidly, I think now is the time for all of us to come together and learn from each other in order to come up with thoughtful and creative ways of taking care of our patients as they confront very difficult treatment decisions. My hope is that we see a little bit now that going beyond the language of informed consent can help our patients picture their experience in more concrete, personalized ways that allow them to make decisions congruent with their goals. While these conversations don't take a whole lot of time, they can have a lasting impact on our patients. 
And finally, as we know, I guarantee that stepping into these challenging discussions will enrich our lives as physicians and fellow humans. Thank you for listening to me today, and I welcome all of your questions and comments. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to open it up to, uh, to the questions, uh, and I'm sorry I'm not in the room, but I, I want to take the chair's prerogative and just ask him the first question. And Dr. Fruci, can you as as are you suggesting a reorganization for patients who are coming to surgery? And, and by that I mean, at this point, patients come to the preoperative assessment clinic and are seen by anesthesia. Uh, they're sent there by their surgeon, um, who I'm assuming has had a conversation. Now the anesthetist will see the patient, and is. At this point, I haven't seen anesthesia decide or have conversations to decide surgery should be canceled or, or have these further conversations. Do you propose a different model for uh, assessment? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I do propose a different model. Not every patient, as we know, requires this in-depth level of uh, advanced care planning, particularly when they're coming for surgery. However, there are a subset of high-risk frail, chronically ill patients that would benefit from having these plans. And right now with the perioperative team, uh, with the anesthesia department that's uh, done in, in conjunction with the, the medicine department, we're in the process of coming up with a high risk surgical clinic. This would be result, this would be um, sort of consecrated to those patients that are deemed high risk by surgeons and recommend having further conversations. It's not uncommon for us to see patients a couple days, if not a day before a major surgery. And when we speak with the surgeons, sometimes, not so much here, but sometimes they uh, express to us the hope that we would cancel their surgery based on the patient's comorbidities. But we know at that time, the train has already left and the clinical momentum is in place. And it's much more difficult at that point to, to have a pause, especially in a very busy clinic day. So I am proposing a different way of doing it for our high-risk surgical patients. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Are there other questions for Dr. Frucci? Gail. I was gonna ask if thank you, it's an excellent talk. Um, I was gonna ask if there's something similar if you're proposing something similar for patients like pre-dialysis or pre-cardiac intervention for devices or other Dr. interventions that are long-lasting and question? Maybe, maybe I'll just repeat the question just to make sure um, everyone hears it. Um, so the question is, am I like? Or could we propose something similar, not only for the surgical patients, but for patients who are, are facing um, difficult treatments like dialysis, the cardiac uh, interventions, the devices? Um, I think, you know, I think that would be helpful. And it's, you know, particularly when we're talking with our patients with LVADs, um, particularly destination LVADs, I think uh, and even we could extend it to patients who are waiting for transplants. I think all of these patients have high risk of morbidity and mortality and planning for the future um, and ensuring that they have the right supports in place uh, is part of our work. And I know we have a system that uh, makes that more difficult, but hopefully um, we're able to change that. Yeah. Dr. Frucci, I have one more question. Maybe sure. related to, um, I guess there's two parts. One is the patient has mm -hmm. this conversation and you make a decision for a, a, some time before the surgery, whatever that decision is. Mm -hmm. um, how, how open are you or not? How, how open sh should we be to revisiting that? That's the first mm. question. The second part is, um, you see the patient have the discussion, are fully aligned in the, the proposed therapy or non-therapy, mm -hmm. but family, some family objects. Could you address both of those? 
Yeah. So, so the two questions, just to make sure I understood them correctly, is you know, what role is there, and how would we uh, approach a patient that maybe changes their mind or wants to revisit their decisions, and then how do we navigate these decisions when there's discord amongst family members? Correct. Um, I think with the first question, you know, these are conversations. It's, they're oftentimes not single conversations, and it's not uncommon for people to change their minds frequently. Um, particularly when I'm thinking about some of our patients who are facing, you know, conversations around uh, pursuing further, ant you know, antineoplastic systemic therapy. So, yes, I recognize that, you know, what I'm proposing here is a single, a single conversation that is, you know, longer than most high risk surgical patients would get. And there's still room for us to revisit these conversations in certain patients. We'd have to come up with a system that would allow for that. Um, because patients do change their mind and oftentimes they have more questions. My hope with using something like the best case, worst case scenario and providing the patients with a visual, a visual aid can be really helpful in anchoring them in uh, their decisions. And then navigating, you know, these treatment decisions when there's discord amongst family members is not uncommon. Um, and we often will sit with this um, in many of our patients. Um, oftentimes a family meeting can be super, uh, helpful in listening to everyone's concerns and providing information that allows them to understand the decisions that are, that have been made by the patient. Um, and oftentimes we have to sit with that discomfort of family members disagreeing with certain treatment options that, that their loved one has made. And just to follow up to the operational component, if if I were to go to the high risk clinic and have this mm -hmm. conversation, um, and then uh, the clinic staff changes on a regular basis, both the, the physicians, you are not both the physician staff changes, mm -hmm. would that suggest that my initial contact with the person about that decision and would would then I would continue that role even though I was no longer doing that job? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it would have to depend on the number of people and how the, the clinic fully runs. Um, I think, I don't know if it's absolutely necessary because, you know, I'm thinking about some of our palliative uh, uh, consults that we do that not like I, you know, it's not necessary for the same physician to be uh, following up when, you know, when the, when we, we change team Teams, so I don't. I don't think it's absolutely necessary. I think good documentation of all of this is the most important. Much like we do for advanced care planning and uh, resuscitation conversations with our patients, and they present to the emergency department. And if we have it documented, it makes the conversations much easier to anchor. Thank you. Any other questions uh, from the uh, audience, virtual and real? Well, hearing none, I want to thank you for an excellent, excellent, excellent thank you. Uh, review. Um, well, not so much a review, introduction into a very uh, difficult area. And it sounds like you're starting with a, a, a group of committed physicians, anesthesia and medicine. And I hope that, uh, that this continues. Thank you very thank much. You, for thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thanks, guys. Thank you from Victoria. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that was really fantastic. I can't see myself. I don't know. Can you see me? Yeah, we can see you and hear you perfectly. Oh, great. I just wanted to say I, I didn't get a chance to unmute fast enough because I was doing my dishes at the time. I was listening to you. I love but, it. <laughs> but um, the structured conversation has been such a paradigm uh, shift in my work as a palliative care physician. Not only the structuring of the conversation, as you mentioned, with serious illness, but also the structured documentation. So if you're able mm -hmm. to have that somehow documented in a structured way, maybe you said that and I missed it. 
And mm -hmm. I did some quality improvement work with the dialysis folks mm -hmm. here in Victoria. And that's mm -hmm. how they actually incorporated in, in, in within their care plans. They mm -hmm. had measured um, response, a spot for the um, responses to the serious illness conversation to actually be in their care plan. So just my yeah, two bits. Yeah, thanks that's very much. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that.